In February 1988, 29-year-old carpenter John Duffy was on trial for rape and the murder of three women. He was one half of a terrifying duo who'd become infamous across London. The newspapers had dubbed them the Railway Killers. As one victim later said, they were like two bodies with one brain. They knew exactly what the other one was going to do. Their bond was unique and wicked. After receiving six life sentences, Duffy still refused to give up the name of his accomplice, a 29-year-old father of four named David Mulcahy. I think Mulcahy is somebody who returns to a normal life and has absolutely no problem in doing that. He doesn't feel bad about what he's done. And it's very much about self-preservation for him. But over a decade later, Mulcahy was still free and Duffy had had enough. He finally confessed to all his crimes and told investigators he would testify against his former friend. It was almost as if he considered this was an act of betrayal of what was a unique and wicked bond uh, for decades. Well, they, these were so poles apart now across the courtroom. John Duffy and David Mulcahy had made their mark as two of the world's most evil killers. I might get a mug here. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veeley now. Two rapists struck fear into the hearts of women across London. When John Duffy was arrested in November 1986, it brought an end to an horrific four-year crime spree across the British capital. But it would be another 15 years before Duffy's accomplice, David Mulcahy, was found guilty for his part in the heinous crimes. Between them, the deadly duo were responsible for over 20 rapes and three murders. It was Duffy's testimony at Mulcahy's trial in the year 2000 that helped to incarcerate his one-time friend. As the judge delivered the sentence, Mulcahy gave no reaction, staring straight ahead. The judge told him these were sadistic killings, and of the two of you, I have no doubt it was you who derived gratification from the act of killing. One of the lead detectives charged with catching the so-called railway killers was Charlie Farquhar. His son, Simon, remembers the case well. These women had their lives disfigured by these two men. Three women lost their lives to these two men. Nothing can ever atone for that, and it's, it's a pretty grim thing to immerse yourself in for a period of time. Over 30 years after the murders, Simon has penned a book about the hunt and capture of Duffy and Mulcahy. Once I started to really delve into it and really investigate it, I realised I was completely unprepared for just how horrific a case like this actually is. Unlike police officers who have all kinds of defences built up over years and years to deal with these sort of things. I did wander into this as a bit of an innocent, and it does still really haunt me. The story of these two killers begins half a century ago. John Duffy was born in 1958 and David Mulcahy in 1959 on separate sides of the Irish Sea. Well, both Duffy and Mulcahy are from Catholic families, um, Irish Catholic families. Duffy was actually born in the Republic of Ireland and came over to England with his family um, when his father was looking for work. Mulcahy was born in England and he was the, the son of a, a man who went on to become a pub landlord. In 1970, the two 11-year-old boys struck up a friendship while attending Haverstock School in North London. I think that Duffy and Mulcahy came together for a variety of different reasons. They were both from Irish families, and the Irish community were still suffering quite a lot of discrimination at this point in time in, in British society. Also, there was a, a sense in which they, they could be a partnership, because Duffy, he was quite short, he had red hair, he was bullied at school, but Mulcahy was bigger, he was broader, and he could be his protector, essentially. So it was quite a, a brotherhood, really, rather than a, any kind of casual friendship. And it was them against the rest of the world. 
By the age of 13, both boys were already displaying signs of disturbing behaviour. Well, Mokai was suspended from school after he and Duffy were found essentially playing a version of cricket but using a live hedgehog. And they were found um, after they'd been engaging in this and, and Duffy was covered in blood and he was laughing at Mokai, he was also covered in blood. So this really is quite a warning signal. It's basically a complete lack of empathy for the, the feelings of, of this living creature that they were tormenting. And they're starting to experiment here their behaviour is starting to escalate and it really is quite a significant red flag. They became fascinated with each other's company. They would haunt Hampstead Heath wearing Halloween masks and jump out and frighten courting couples who used to meet on Hampstead Heath, terrify them and they took enormous pleasure from it. So these two, they're really having the time of their lives doing this. They're really enjoying having that power over others. But I think to come across them out there in the park in the dark would have been really, really frightening. As the two teenagers became young men, Duffy and Mulcahy's scare tactics took a criminal turn. So in their case, you started with, with the pranks. It moved on to burglary and, and car thefts. Like they, they, they stole the cars again. They didn't steal the car because they want to sell the car. It wasn't for, for profit. They stole the car because they wanted to drive around and they wanted to have fun. But then we see that escalate. We see that their physical violence angle kind of start to come out a little bit more. So we hear stories of them shooting at people in the streets with an air pistol. The pair found work at Westminster City Council. Duffy as a carpenter and Mulcahy as a plumber. On one job, Mulcahy had spotted a woman who he thought needed to be taught a lesson. He and Duffy went to her house after dark, intent on raping the woman. So Duffy and Mulcahy break into the house and lay in wait for the woman whose house Mulcahy has been decorating. But the woman, thankfully, doesn't come home that night. She's gone to a friend's. This infuriates both Duffy and Mulcahy. So you've got a, a plan developing here. They're starting to actually decide, well, this is what we're going to do. Um, this isn't something that's opportunistic. This is something that's very much premeditated. Duffy and Mulcahy were undeterred. They tried the same plan again with a different woman, but escaped from her house when she returned home with a man. And they probably talk about, say, look, the thing about breaking into people's houses and waiting for them is no good because we don't know if they're going to come back. We don't know if they're going to come back with somebody else. So instead of that, how about we actually drive around, find someone, see someone on the street, and then we pounce on them on, on a dark alley or something like that. So I think the, the, the rush that they got from breaking into the house just motivated them to go and do the, the real thing. By 1980, both men were in their early 20s and married, but their lust for rape remained. Two years later, they were ready to strike. In October 1982, they found the first one. 21-year-old girl coming back from a party, carrying a teddy bear. They put a knife to her throat and forced her into a garden of an empty house. They said, I think it was Duffy who said, don't worry, we only want the teddy bear. Nothing could have been further from the truth. Um, they stripped the girl, gagged her, blindfolded her and raped her. From then on, the attacks became incredibly prolific. At one point, there was three in one night. Uh, they would generally drive around uh, together, um, listening to music to psych themselves up. They carried with them uh, a kit of balaclavas or masks. Uh, Makahi would um, put uh, gaffer tape inside his jacket, which would then be used to gag the victims. He'd often blindfold them as well. Paul Cheston from the Evening Standard newspaper recalls the fear felt across the capital. That added to the sense of terror felt by uh, Londoners that it was almost a military-style operation, and the planning that was going into it was much more than just spur of attack, moment attacks. McCarthy would always ask the victims their names and addresses as well and would often steal uh, items which had their address on, library cards, that sort of thing. The idea was that if these victims went to the police, we will find you, you know, and so on. They always made sure their victims were reduced to a state of abject terror. One such attack occurred in the summer of 1984. 
The attack on the two Danish au pairs took place in July 1984. That night, Duffy and McCarthy had been driving around for a long time, unable to find a victim. And finally, they saw these two 18-year-old girls walking along Spaniards Road on the edge of Hampstead Heath. They'd been out in the West End and missed the last train home and were walking back. Um, they decided to uh, attack them both. Uh, Duffy had a replica gun, McCarthy had a knife. They were dragged off the road and onto the heath and brutally, brutally assaulted. For three years, Duffy and Mulcahy continued undetected. In late 1985, the police uh, had connected 24 attacks on women in North London, and posters went up across London for the North London rapists. Uh, they knew they were looking for two men, a shorter man and a taller one. They didn't know a great deal about the taller man, but they knew that the shorter man was an acecreator blood group, uh, had fair hair. The taller man they knew a lot less about. He had a darker complexion, he had a mole on his chin, he had mousy brown hair and was about 5 foot 11 tall and was much more violent than the shorter man. The majority of the attacks had taken place in the vicinity of train stations. The press had dubbed them the railway rapists. It was a very big story in London. Uh, there was a widespread concern, not just because rapists were uh, loose, but because they were uh, finding victims in and around railway stations. And London uh, has a, millions of Londoners uh, travel on public transport, and it was a serious, serious concern uh, for Londoners. But it was about to get worse. Their next victim would not just be raped, she would be murdered. By December 1985, John Duffy and David Mulcahy had been sexually assaulting women in and around railway stations in London for over three years. Still undetected by the police, their confidence was growing. I think it was inevitable that this was only going to escalate further because we've got two men here who are really enjoying the sexual violence that they've been perpetrating. And often when you look at offenders who are engaged in this kind of behaviour, they're not going to just stop at a particular level. They want to keep upping the ante. So I think murder was unfortunately inevitable here. On December the 29th, 1985, Alison Day caught a train to Hackney Wick Station to meet her fiancé. Alison Day was a 19-year-old uh, secretary who lived in Upminster um, with her parents. Uh, she'd been adopted as a baby and brought into a very, very loving household. She worked as a secretary in a local solicitor's office. She was enormously bubbly and popular, and she just got engaged. But Alison never completed her journey. At that time, obviously, it was a torture for her parents, not knowing if she'd just run away, although it seemed absolutely you know, implausible that she had. What had actually happened was that she'd got the train to Hackney Wick um, and Duffy and McCarthy were waiting for her on the platform. They could quite easily have walked her out of the station, but instead they decided to walk her across the live rail tracks, down the railway siding, and then under the uh, railway bridge. There they both committed horrific attacks on her. Um, and at this point, as far as Duffy was aware, the plan was to leave Alison on the far side of the bridge and then make their escape. But McCarthy wanted to do something more than that, so he made her walk along the outside ledge of the bridge. She couldn't swim. It was also at one degree below freezing, and she fell into the River Lee, screaming out that she couldn't swim. She waded to the edge, and Duffy helped her out, and then she managed to, uh, to run. She ran for her life, and this enraged Mulcahy, and Mulcahy yelled out, get the bitch, John, get her. Duffy caught up with Alison, but Mulcahy's slip of the tongue had sealed her fate. He said to Duffy, we have to do this because she's seen us and she knows your name now. He cuts up the blouse she's wearing and uses it, it to strangle her. And he says to Duffy, you turn the tourniquet one more time just so that we're in it together. Alison was begging and pleading for her life, and her last words were, please, it's, it's only the moustache I've seen. I won't tell anyone. Do not hurt me. Um, just unbelievable. She was strangled, rolled into the river, and then they both drove back. Uh, Duffy was panicking. Uh, McCarthy said, we would have been done for attempted murder anyway. It's got to be, that's, that's just the way it is. He dropped Duffy off. McCarthy picked his children up, went back home, and Alison Day was dead. 
The 19-year-old's body was found three weeks later, face down in a canal. The railway rapists had become the railway killers. Duffy and Mulcahy had strangled Alison to death using a tourniquet. I think when we're looking at the murder of Alison Day and we hear about them twisting the, the tourniquet together, basically what they're doing here is saying, we're in this together, we've both done this. You can't blame it on me, I can't blame it on you. So there is that, that pact going back to their school days when they said they're not gonna grasp on each other. That really is the, the kind of cementing of that. Less than six months later, Duffy and Mulcahy struck again. This time, their victim was even younger. Marty Tambosa was a Dutch schoolgirl. She just celebrated her 15th birthday. On Thursday, the 17th of April, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, after coming home from school, she had something to eat, had a drink, and then got on her bike to cycle into the village to buy some sweets from the shop. Her mum said to her, as she always did, don't take the railway path because it's very quiet along there. Take the long way round. Marty, being a teenage girl, thought it would be all right. And she took the railway path, and Duffy and Mulcahy were waiting at the end of it for her. Marcha was raped by both men in the woods near Horsley Station. Mulcahy used a rock to knock the 15-year-old schoolgirl unconscious, and then made the decision that she had to die. He then instructs Duffy that he has to kill her. After all, I killed the first one, you've got to kill the second one. They take her belt, put it round her neck, and they stick a, a stick through the belt to tighten the pressure on her neck. And they do indeed kill the poor 15-year-old. Innocent, had done nothing more than ride her bicycle, and she'd done nothing to these two men. It was an absolutely abhorrent, depraved, disgraceful crime. Once Duffy had killed Marty Tambosa, McCarthy ran up to him and said, well done, you've done good. And uh, almost like he was the captain of a football team, congratulating a new player. Um, he then told Duffy to go back to the station and said he would see him there. He said he wanted to go back to the body to make sure there were no fingerprints left on the rock. He actually went back to make sure that she was dead and to make a pretty vile attempt to destroy any forensic evidence there was by setting fire to her. Marcher's body was found in the woods the following day. The sight that greeted those police officers was, was absolutely horrific. She'd been savagely raped, submitted to brutal head injuries, uh, strangled, and the body had been set on fire in a clear attempt to destroy forensic evidence. She was lying uh, beside um, some bluebells, and the police christened the inquiry Operation Bluebell uh, in tribute to her. Metropolitan Police Detective Charlie Farquhar who was investigating the murder of Alison Day, contacted his colleagues in Surrey Police. He believed the two murders were connected. And when he told um, Surrey on the phone, Surrey realized that the piece of wood that was lying next to Marty's body wasn't in fact just a piece of wood on the ground. It had actually fallen out of the knots in the rope and obviously was the same murder method. And at that point, this became a joint murder inquiry. Shortly afterwards, the connection was made with the London rapes. And this went from being a small inquiry being run from a porter cabin to the biggest criminal manhunt since the search for the Yorkshire Ripper. Duffy and Mulcahy didn't wait long to claim their third victim. On May the 18th, 1986, recently married Anne Locke boarded a train for Brookman's Park Station in Hertfordshire, but she never made it home. Anne Locke was 29 years old. She was a bright, attractive girl with a huge amount of uh, talent and uh, uh, future in broadcasting. She was a secretary at London Weekend Television, and she was in love. She'd uh, been married just four weeks earlier, had returned from a, a dream honeymoon in the Seychelles, where she'd gone scuba diving. She still had a suntan from that lovely holiday, and she disappeared. Paul Dockley from Hertfordshire Police led the inquiry into Anne's disappearance. The weirdest thing was that um, the initial officers attending this missing person inquiry discovered that her bike was missing, and in fact, we found it behind the shed, leaned up against a tree, which was unusual to say the least. And so we started searching. We started searching around the railway station. We, we also did a trawl of 
people that may have been on the train coming out of London on that particular night. It was the latest twist in a story that had captivated the British public. The disappearance of Anne Locke was a media sensation that summer, the missing bride story, as it was called. And the headlines about missing bride escalated. The uh, speculation became more frenzied about what could have happened to her. They were really piecing uh, her disappearance to the two previous murders. Uh, and there was a tangible air of, you know, what are the police doing? They cannot even find a body, let alone find the people responsible. But the police had little to go on. They could not even be sure that Anne had reached Brookman's Park Station. The first time that the police genuinely realised that Anne was probably dead was when Inspector Paul Dockley was searching the area. And even though the search was massive, the search was generally at ground level, and being a good detective, uh, he looked up and up in the trees, cradled in the branches, was Anne's diary. I didn't know it was Anne's diary immediately, but I saw it in the tree, so we recovered that. And within the next day, we reasserted our search in that area and recovered her purse, her LWT uh, pass, and her address book. So at that point, which was probably four weeks into the inquiry, we knew at that point that Anne had returned to Brookmans Park. And just a week later, the police found out the devastating truth of what had happened to 29-year-old Anne. Eventually, after nine weeks, the search was called off. Um, the police had gone to the edge of the Hertfordshire uh, boundary and still couldn't find anything. And then a few days later, some railway workers found her body uh, just into the Metropolitan Police District, dreadfully decomposed. Following the discovery of Anne Locke's body, we actually developed a, a joint investigation with Hertfordshire, the Met, Surrey, and British Transport Police. Investigating a murder is almost like starting a jigsaw puzzle with a piece of blue sky, because you do not know the pattern of how things uh, have occurred. Uh, you're faced with a scene but it doesn't actually tell you necessarily who the offender is. So you're working through that jigsaw of trying to put together all the elements in order to prove a case. And it's hard as a detective to detach yourself from what you actually see. Uh, you're dealing with this uh, on a regular basis, and, um, but I don't think I've ever come across a case like this. As one victim later said, they were like two bodies with one brain. They knew exactly what the other one was going to do. If they split up and ran in different directions, they knew where they were going to meet up and so on. Their bond was unique and wicked. While police from three regions searched for them, Duffy and Mulcahy remained hidden in plain sight, married men with regular jobs. But the net was closing in on the pair. In the summer of 1986, Hertfordshire, Surrey and London's Metropolitan Police Forces were working together to try and capture the two men the papers were calling the railway killers. But the evidence they had was minimal. So this was the 1980s. Forensic science was still in its infancy compared to the advances that have been made since. Um, also, um, it wasn't just forensic science, which was in quite a primitive state at the time. Also, police treatment of sexual crimes wasn't as sophisticated as understanding as it is now. The surviving victims had provided investigators with descriptions of their attackers. They knew that one of the rapists was tall and violent, the other short with piercing blue eyes. Forensic evidence suggested that the shorter man had the blood group A. We were literally going through a, a, a list of people that could be possible offenders called the Z-men. And the Z-men uh, had been previously arrested. And you've got to remember, this is pre-DNA, so we're the precursor to DNA. And we were looking at asecretors, so people who secreted in their blood or their uh, saliva or, or semen uh, uh, an asecretor factor. The Z-men had over 2,000 people in it. John Duffy was on it because of a serious assault on his wife the previous year. Um, he was number 1,595 on that list. And it was just a case of working through the list and interviewing every single one of those men. Eventually, number 1595 came up and it was time for him to be questioned. 
He sat down, was quite polite and cooperative, but was uh, behaved rather strangely. He was trying to be much too helpful, and his answers were rather glib. The two police officers interviewing him had an uneasy feeling. They left the room and said to each other, this could be him, not least because of these piercing blue eyes he had, which many of the rape victims had commented on, the shorter man having very piercing blue eyes. Despite their suspicions, Duffy was released, but before long, he was back. The two investigators rang me and said, Governor, you won't believe this. He said, last night, John Duffy presented himself at West Hampstead Police Station. Uh, he'd been slashed across the chest with a blade, um, and he was saying that he had amnesia. They took him to his home address. He didn't recognise his mum, his dad, his dog, nothing. And he was taken to Free and Barnet Hospital, where he was sectioned. The investigation had taken a bizarre twist. Duffy was still a suspect, but the police were not permitted to talk to him while he was sectioned. So Duffy was at Free and Barnet Hospital, and we weren't allowed to interview him um, for at least eight weeks. And unbeknown to us, we thought he was in a secure unit at Free and Barnet Hospital. In actual fact, he was allowed to come and go. Duffy had been attacking on his own since mid-1984, and unlike Mulcahy, uh, didn't possess the same level of self-control. He was becoming wildly unstable, and he also took uh, a lot more risks when he was carrying out these attacks and was much more careless. And unfortunately, uh, he went out to um, a railway line and raped a young girl whilst he was in the care of Free and Barnet Hospital. The last attack he committed when he knew the police were closing in on him was in a, on a 14-year-old schoolgirl in Watford. And during that attack, her blindfold slipped and she saw him very clearly. Um, when Duffy was arrested, that girl walked into the ID parade and walked straight up and pointed him out. And at that point, that was the end for John Duffy. He said nothing. He said no comment to everything. He didn't deny anything, he just said no comment. He would talk to me about martial arts as long as the day, you know. He was quite happy to talk about that. But anything to do with rape, missing girls, murders, not interested. And of course, his answer was, I've been in hospital, I've had amnesia. I don't remember anything. I don't remember anything before going into hospital. Detectives knew they needed some solid evidence if they were going to charge Duffy with murder and the string that he and Mulcahy had used to tie up Marcia Tamboza seven months earlier was about to give them just that. They used a particular piece of string that was called Sumyan, and a lot of us will think string is string is string, but when you get down to the forensic detail, how it's made, what it's made of, all of these things can be very different, and if you happen to use a very unusual piece of string, it's going to help identify where that's come from. And the company said, this is a very unusual piece of string because it's been taken from the end of the yarn. So basically, it's on a loom and it's cut, and this is an end piece. And they said to us, if you can find the ball of string, we could do a match. So the, uh, the search team, who went to Duffy's parents' address, uh, searched the outside toilet and in a bucket in there, was a ball of Somyon. It was enough to finally put an end to the murderous career of one of the railway killers. Gradually, the evidence is building up against Duffy, and he was charged with the murder of Anne Locke, in addition to the murder of Alison Day, uh, Marty Tamboza, and a number of rapes. Investigators were certain that Duffy's accomplice was his oldest friend, David Mulcahy. He was actually arrested four times over the, over the next few months. Every time that the police got another break, they brought him in again, but eventually realised it just, there just wasn't enough evidence. There was no forensic evidence to connect him with the crimes at all. When they searched his vehicles, they found in the cab of his van masking tape, balaclavas, all sorts of things that incriminated him, but none of it was enough. But his name was known to the press, and a lot of people, a lot of pressmen, went to see him, to see, just to gauge what sort of reaction he would give. Of course, there was no reaction, he was uh, even no comment, and he got increasingly angry about what he called as harassment. But the press knew that there were two people involved in the railway rapist cases, and 
Duffy's friend was the prime suspect. John Duffy would go to trial alone, and there was more bad news for investigators. The judge instructed the jury to dismiss the murder charge of Anne Locke due to a lack of evidence. This caused a lot of anguish with Anne Locke's family and a lot of surprise uh, amongst the press. But the problem was that with in the Locke case, there was no surviving victim to give any evidence. There were no witnesses to the attack. The fact that the body had been laid unfound for two months meant there was no DNA evidence. In February 1988, John Duffy's trial began at the Old Bailey in London. John Duffy walked into the uh, witness box at, uh, at the Old Bailey and put up one of the worst offences ever heard uh, by an Old Bailey jury uh, to suggest uh, that he was suffering from amnesia and could remember nothing about what happened during the period in which he is accused of uh, murders and uh, rapes was, uh, frankly, an insult to the intelligence of uh, anyone in court, uh, let alone the jury. His whole body language was of defiance. I am going to give you nothing. I am standing here sticking to my story, and I don't care. And the piercing eyes that his victims spoke of, the wild, staring blue eyes, absolutely radiated out from the witness box uh, across the court. Duffy was found guilty of two murders and five rapes. He was given six life sentences, but despite everything, he refused to give up the name of his accomplice and best friend. Well, maybe the reason why Duffy kept quiet right at the beginning, they had the agreement that they had from a very young age, and they never broke the agreement, we're never gonna rat on each other. So when he went to prison, he probably decided, I'm going to stay true because I am, you know, a good friend or I am the man I am, whatever, I'm true to my word. As Duffy's sentence began, David Mulcahy remained a free man. The married father of four set up his own decorating business and life went on as normal. I think Mulcahy is somebody who returns to a normal life and has absolutely no problem in doing that. And, and that's because he can switch. He can flip very easily because he doesn't feel empathy for his victims. He doesn't feel bad about what he's done. And it's very much about self-preservation for him. Everybody knew that David Mulcahy was the second man, um, but he honestly thought that he got away with that. And for the next 10 years, he pretty much had. But as Duffy's time in prison passed by, something inside of him clicked. After claiming to be suffering from amnesia, he suddenly got his memory back. By 1999, he was ready to talk and tell the police all about his accomplice, David Mulcahy. 11 years after his conviction, John Duffy was in prison serving six life sentences for his part in a series of rapes and murders in and around London between 1982 and 1986. But Duffy's partner in crime, David Mulcahy, remained free. Mulcahy was the one who first suggested, let's break into the girl's house. He was the one who first suggested, let's go and find victims on the street. And he was the one who first suggested, let's commit murder. But the one who was paying all the price was Duffy. So it's very, very easy for you to see that after 10 years, you know, the little fuse from Duffy got to an end. And he was like, forget it, I'm gonna come and clean. In 1997, Duffy, who had originally claimed to be suffering from amnesia about the crimes, had begun visiting a prison psychologist. So, basically, Duffy had been in prison for 10 years and thought this is an opportunity to talk and talk and talk. And basically, he told the psychologist about the offences that he had committed and the fact that he hadn't committed them alone. During their conversations, Duffy reveals that he committed his crimes with another person, and she casually asks which prison his co-defendant is in, and Duffy drops the bombshell. He's not in prison, he was never caught. Um, she says, I have to tell the police about this, which Duffy agrees to. And so she tells the police, John Duffy's just named his accomplice. It's someone called David Mulcahy. It was a big breakthrough for detectives who'd been trying to bring Mulcahy to justice for over a decade. And a huge slice of fortune was about to initiate his downfall. 
There's an extraordinary coincidence here. At the same time that this was going on, a similar series of attacks was taking place on Hampstead Heath, and police began to suspect that David McCarthy may have become active again. They had a DNA profile for the attacker. McCarthy was brought in, uh, questioned, they took his DNA and it didn't match. And once again, he left the police station, uh, very cocky, very arrogant. But the police now had Mulcahy's DNA on file. They had to go back 15 years to find a match. Amazingly, in deep storage was the clothing of the Danish au pairs raped on Hampstead Heath in 1984. And when the clothing was run through forensics, one sample of clothing had Duffy's DNA on it and the other had David McCarthy's DNA. And suddenly, after all those years of thinking he got away with it, suddenly that case had come back to haunt him. On February the 6th, 1999, David Mulcahy was taken into custody. He would never be free again. As soon as I found out that the police had arrested and charged uh, a new suspect in the uh, railway rapist cases, I, like every other press man who had been in any sort of involvement in the case, immediately knew that it had to be David Mulcahy. He thought they were just clutching at straws. He thought that this was just another attempt to to arrest him, which was going to fall through. When they sat down to question him, the first thing they asked him was about the night of the 15th of July, 1984, um, in uh, the company of John Duffy. And he wasn't expecting this at all. And then the police revealed that they'd found his DNA on an exhibit from that crime. And the odds of it being another person other than him were one in one billion, at which point, uh, a police officer had to hold up the waste paper basket because he was violently sick. He realised that the game was up. Mulcahy's trial was set for October 2000, and the prosecution had a surprise witness lined up. John Duffy was ready to testify against his former friend. He had admitted to detectives that the pair had killed all three women, including Anne Locke. Duffy couldn't be retried for the murder of Anne Locke because at that time they were still in force something called the double jeopardy rule, which means you can't be tried for the same crime twice. It was a silly law which is now gone, um, but Duffy said himself at the time, if I could be tried again for this one, I would be. So there was never any point where he was trying to minimise his involvement. After it seemed like he was going to get away with murder, the gathered press were excited to finally see Mulcahy on trial. Paul Cheston was in the courtroom throughout. The Mulcahy trial was unquestionably the trial of the year at the Old Bailey. Um, there was huge anticipation at reopening this historic case dating back almost 15 years. And as always, when the case opens and the defendant is brought in, everyone's eyes just immediately shift straight to the dock. He looked more like a bank manager than a, uh, a serial killer. And he immediately set about uh, giving an air of uh, relaxed, uh, as if this was just a, a formality that would be thrown out of court straight away. On November the 6th, 2000, John Duffy entered the courtroom to give evidence against his former friend and accomplice. There was huge anticipation, a real free in court. Uh, when John Duffy uh, shuffled in through the judge's entrance, not through the main entrance, because he was a Category A prisoner, the first Category A prisoner, serving life murderer, uh, to give evidence for the Crown at, uh, at the Old Bailey. And when he entered court, he shuffled. Uh, he had his head down, he would mumble. The piercing eyes were hooded. He, he didn't want to look up. The tension in the courtroom between the two killers was palpable. Duffy avoided eye contact with Mulcahy. It was almost as if he considered this was an act of betrayal and he couldn't look in that direction. He didn't want to catch Mulcahy's eye. Meanwhile, Mulcahy in the dark was acting as if he'd never met him and this was some complete stranger. And he was uh, uh, scribbling notes and this and that. And uh, uh, they seemed bizarre, but what was a unique and wicked bond uh, for decades, these were so poles apart now across the uh, across the courtroom. True to his word, Duffy gave a detailed account of the duo's career of rape and murder. His accounts, particularly of Alison Day pleading for mercy with Mulcahy claiming, we're going to have to kill her because she's seen us. And Alison Day saying, I've only seen the moustache. Um, don't do this to me. Uh, don't hurt me. I won't tell anybody. And Mulcahy, in Duffy's words, twisting the tourniquet and throttling her to death. 
that for the first and only time, John Duffy showed a glimmer of remorse. His eyes welled up, his voice faltered, the judge called a halt, he was led away, the case was adjourned for 10, 15 minutes. Duffy gave testimony across two weeks of the five-month murder trial. On February the 2nd, 2001, the jury had made a decision on the fate of David Mulcahy. And when the jury foreman was asked to go through uh, on each count on this long indictment and answered the first uh, verdict, do you find uh, Mulcahy guilty or not guilty, answered guilty, there was such an escape of emotion and like steam from a kettle of relief and then it went through the indictment guilty 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 and when it came to the verdict on Anne Locke because this had been a case that Duffy had been found not guilty of because of the lack of evidence this was finally the chance to really lay this to rest and when a guilty came in on that as well the atmosphere was extraordinary in that court and there was a lot of victims a lot of victims families in court an inevitable outbreak of relief of tears um, Mokai himself seemed entirely unmoved, it's almost as if he expected it. And it was an extraordinary scene uh, at the Old Bailey, even by the Old Bailey standards. And David Mokai, he had nothing else, no other way of hurting those victims anymore. So as he walked out of the dock, he looked over at two of the victims sitting in the public gallery and smirked at them. It was his last desperate act of, of revenge. And, and then that was it. And then he was promptly sentenced to a total of 258 years in prison. Um, so I think we can safely say he's never going to get out. Sentencing Judge Michael Hyam told Mulcahy these were acts of desolating wickedness. You descended to the depths of depravity. Finally, 15 years after the murder of Anne Locke, John Duffy and David Mulcahy were both behind bars. 12 years were added to Duffy's sentence, while Mulcahy has still never confessed to any of the crimes. I think the fact that Mulcahy has always maintained his innocence really is testament to his narcissism. He is protecting the, the image of himself that he's putting out there to other people. He doesn't want others to believe that he is this individual who's carried out these heinous crimes. There's always been speculation that Duffy and Mulcahy were guilty of other rapes, some of which will not even have been reported. But thank goodness, at least, finally, they were brought to justice. These were perhaps crimes that they may not have committed had they never met, but they come together and you create the perfect storm. For four years, John Duffy and David Mulcahy targeted vulnerable women in and around London. They callously raped over 20 and murdered three, one of them a 15-year-old schoolgirl. Although initially detained in 1986, it wasn't until Duffy broke the bond that he and Mulcahy had shared since their childhood that their world of lies fell apart and justice was finally served upon the twisted pair known as the Railway Killers.